Well, my thanks to Alex for inviting me to Strange Loop and for all of you for showing up. It would have been very daunting to come into this room and see just my husband. Uh, good morning. As you know, software rarely works as intended while it's being written. Things go wrong, errors are inevitable. A standard behavior in some software development is see the bug, swat the bug, and be done with it. In contrast, one of the things I've observed over time um, is that for experts, error, or more broadly, things that go amiss during software development is opportunity. Opportunity to understand better, to question assumptions, to detect miscommunication or misconceptions, to, to stumble onto insight. Experts accept that error happens. They're not fearful of it, but they are watchful. So they often hold off swatting the bug, instead asking, that's odd, why is that? So indeed, error is seen as a useful input throughout the course of progressive development. This talk summarizes some insights about how experts and high-performing teams use that opportunity. So just to give you a glimpse of what's to come, I'll say a bit about the research and evidence behind the talk. Uh, I'll provide a brief oversight of what we mean by active error, and then I'll spend most of the time talking through the kinds of practices and perspectives I've observed in high-performing teams. By high-performing teams, I mean the kind of teams that produce software on time, under budget, works for first time, and as one of my informants said, no loud brown smells. So the insights that I'll offer are interrelated, they're not discrete, and you'll notice some repeated themes. Simply put, I pick the brains of software designers and developers, of people like you. I've spent some 30 years studying experts and high-performing software development teams at work in industry across a range of domains in order to, act to articulate their strategies and practices. My purpose is to understand the nature of software design and development expertise. Just to be clear, I'll be referring throughout the talk to the teams and the developers whom I've observed, but I hope you'll hear that I'm meeting people like you um, who are fascinating to researchers like me. In effect, I act as a mirror or a lens, uh, reflecting, focusing. I'm, I'm interested in articulating what successful software developers actually do, not in dictating what they should do. So I should, I'm hoping the talk will have some resonance with your experience. Indeed, if you have comments or examples, I'd love to hear from you. Research in software engineering predominantly considers error retrospectively. Um, based on analysis of software in operation, usually of massive projects, usually in the context of flaws left in the code that need to be fixed, or system failures that arise from a collection of smaller flaws. Um, my research takes a more ecological view of error during software development. Uh, in particular, I'm paying attention to those smaller flaws, the kinds of things that go amiss during software development in order to understand the developer behavior that allows them to detect, identify, and recover from error. The psychology literature offers the concept of active error. These, these are human errors during a task, and they take different forms. So, for example, slips of action, things like typos, uh, lapses of memory or attention, meaning that things get missed or dropped, and mistakes made in forming intentions or executing intentions during problem solving, so faulty or inappropriate decisions. For recovery, a person has to know that an error has occurred, has to identify what was done wrong and what should have been done, and then understand how to undo the effects of the error and to implement what should have been done. So active errors can be caught in the act. Um, or they can be detected a little bit later during standard checks and evaluation, uh, by obstacles to progress, uh, from environmental cues that supply feedback, so messages in the your IDE, um, through unexpected outcomes. So error detection and recovery unfold throughout the course of progressive problem solving. But what is it that experts and high-performing teams do that gives them better results? 
In contrast to eliminating bugs as quickly as possible, experts reflect on the problem and on the solution model. So for example, from Tamara Lopez's work, a developer looked into what was initially seen as a pretty straightforward bug. The kind of fix, the fix was trivial, altering basic conditional behavior in a single function. No big deal. Now a root cause analysis might just have interpreted that as a novice programming error or one of those things that just happens. But the developer's experience suggested that that didn't tell the whole story. So after deeper investigation, he found that this bug didn't just happen. Um, instead, it may have had its origin several months earlier, uh, shaped by decisions related to open source technology selection, the introduction of new communication channels, and design choices taken to meet domain-specific requirements. So his greater awareness led from a simple bug to recognition of a deeper design flaw. So experts don't just fix one bug. They recognize that a small bug may signal something more, and rather than dismissing simple bugs as novice errors or one of those things that just happens, they stand back and they look for the other bugs that hang out with it. They consider dependencies. They reflect on the code structure in order to understand whether the bug is part of a, a bigger problem, thereby often detecting other deeper issues such as flaws and misconceptions. As you know, software developers do not work in an ideal world, um, but rather in an environment dominated by conflicting demands and resource pressures, especially time pressures. So bugs are understood in the context of software use, um, and effective triage is essential. And it has to do with a cost-benefit assessment of the relative impact of the bug against the cost of fixing the bug. Bugs that aren't important or urgent are often tolerated or deferred. I'm gonna talk about three concepts, tolerating, deferring, and compromising that are all interrelated, but I'll separate them conceptually first. So software is like a laboratory apparatus. It gets tested for standard operating ranges. So for example, an oscilloscope is rated for the frequencies and voltages for, for which it's calibrated and for which its operation is reliable. Lots of software can be understood in a similar way as having standard operating ranges. Um, and experts are, con are attentive to the context in which it does have those. And they have, therefore, an understanding of when it's okay to break the rules um, and to tolerate bugs that are outside the normal scope of operation. So for example, um, if you're assessing the stability of a meteorological model, it probably doesn't matter if the temperature in Greenland is over 100 degrees centigrade. Brian Randall encompasses this notion of fault tolerance in his concept of dependability. His definition leaves room for imperfection in the code if the imperfection doesn't impair the software's dependability or reliability. So tolerance is on the one hand about managing the bug technically in the sense of Randall's fault tolerance, but tolerance is also about managing the bug socially, leaving compilation warnings in the code as reminders, documenting the rationale for tolerating. Um, and in safety critical context, developers typically wrap the code, preventing it from operating outside um, that reliable range. Related to tolerating is deferring, putting off addressing the error. Sometimes deferral is an outcome of triage. The error is not prioritized, but it's not forgotten. At other times, deferral is a design move. Um, as one informant explained it, um, and I'm just gonna put it in his words, one way to solve a problem is just to ignore it for a while. Recently, I spent two 18-hour days trying to solve this problem. At the end of the second day, I took a long bike ride home, and I had to stop halfway home. I realized the solution. Thrashing is a concept you're probably familiar with. You know, it's understood as poorly directed, ineffective problem solving. Both novices and experts thrash. The difference is that novices fail to realize that they're doing it in good time, and they fail to break out of the cycle. In contrast, experts recognize when they thrash, and they break out of it by stopping the cycle by, for example, by asking for help from colleagues. There's evidence with only a few days separation 
from the event, developers are able to articulate their awareness of different parts of the thrashing, what contributed to it, and to achieve some insight about the underlying problem. So sometimes just taking a pause is incredibly effective. Similarly, developers have been shown to compromise it at times in order to move the work along. Their strategies can include deliberate suboptimal choices calculated to serve immediate needs um, in order to enable progressive development and progressive improvement. So in this case, an error could be corrected to a working state, but the developer might you know, kind of be left with a sense that this is a compromise. There's something not quite right about it, it doesn't cover everything I need it to cover, or it's been achieved in a way that's ugly and unsatisfying. In an observed example, an issue identified by a developer surfaced as a bug several times over the course of a couple of years. Um, he was working on open source tools, um, and in different areas of the software being developed, the, the bug recurred. It turned out the issue was related to the use of Unicode, which presented particular complexities um, when introduced to the domain. Um, and although the program was well versed in the technology, a solution wasn't immediately apparent. However, rather than just signaling a lack of knowledge as the root cause, the developer managed the issue over time, implementing incremental pragmatic solutions as required to advance the larger program of work. And this strategy allowed him to explore the problem over time and ultimately to find a better solution. In another example, uh, the developer described compromising as a design strategy. In his words, we're developing an integration framework for composing AI and widgets for users so that the user can choose what kind of AI you want, what kind of widgets you want, update the dashboard live, and whew, away you go. I know that in the long time, I need some sort of persistence mechanism. Now, I could invest a lot of time in some huge, complex database, or I could start out with a file because that's not the problem I need to address yet. I need to address being able to say what sort of AI I want, I want declaratively and be able to spin it up on a machine somewhere. I'm compromising by delaying that decision by saying here's a little scaffolding and I'll come back to that later. But it's enough to start addressing this larger problem that needs to be decided before I talk about persistence mechanisms. Some pieces need to be addressed first, but you need some scaffolding to even start. And once one piece solidifies, it informs the other pieces. So my strategy for compromise is focus on the essence. Always shoot for the middle ground, building just enough so you can get going and keeping it slightly general so that you can move forward. Compromising is a decision-making process for building. So then, at the end, you hopefully haven't compromised anything. Um, and you've accomplished more than you might have hoped to. Developers' strategies and responses to things that go amiss are fundamentally pragmatic. Uh, software developers don't work in an ideal world, but in an environment dominated by conflicting demands and time pressures, and their strategies may include suboptimal choices calculated to serve immediate needs and move things along. Behaviors that may appear naive or dysfunctional may not be. Um, there are good reasons to try simple formulaic solutions before investing in systematic analysis. There are good reasons to buy time and hence potentially gather information and gather evidence by tolerating, deferring, or compromising. And crucially, high-performing teams keep track of those choices and revisit them. And developers also have safety nets. Experts mind the gaps. Rather than just looking for what they expect, they pay attention to the feedback and cues that might alert them to something amiss. They pay attention to the spaces between things, to the interfaces, interactions between components, integration with other systems, design concepts hidden behind standard data types. They pay attention to what isn't shown, to what's missing, whether it's missing from the design or from the information, or from the tool they're using, or from the implementation. This promotes detection of flaws, not just in the software itself, but throughout the development ecosystem. One team was working on an engine control unit for a 1.4 megawatt engine. 
The team had done hardware in the loop testing in which the actuator was simulated as part of that testing. When they put the real actuator in, it was nothing like the simulation. <laughs> Unbeknownst to the team, it was different from what was simulated because the internal control loop was faster than the specified control loop. Um, as, the as the developer reported, everything went bonkers and something was obviously wrong and someone hit the emergency stop. As it turned out, the customer who had specified the response times on the actuator had been too aggressive. Uh, the PI control loop with a high gain tried to move quickly. Um, but the team had a control loop inside the controller, so the two control loops were fighting each other to the extent that the whole bench was rattling. Um, as he summarized, this shows the value of hitting a problem with more than one hammer. So experts challenge assumptions, models, designs through mechanisms such as the skeptic in the corner, pair debugging, code reviews based on discussion, um, and in doing so, they're mitigating against biases in human reasoning. For example, in both naturalistic and lab studies of test case selection um, by Teasley, Leventhal, and Rollman, testers were four times more likely to choose positive test cases than negative ones. Four times more likely to try to show that the pro program works than to find out under what conditions it fails. Research evidence suggests that experts do not make fewer slips and minor errors than less expert developers. In fact, they probably make more. The difference is that they have better safety nets. So whereas many people look for evidence that things are working as expected, experts and high-performing teams are more available to contrary evidence, and indeed, their practices prime them to look for contrary evidence. They ask why. They engage users, they decorrelate, they elicit and contrast different perspectives, they seek falsification. They ask not just, how would I know if this was right, but how would I know if this were wrong? And how would I know if an alternative were, were right or better? And importantly, they understand that code is read by people. Um, they write comments about what is not in the code, things like their intentions and assumptions. So understanding something by breaking it um, is a form of analytic. Introducing errors or flaws deliberately can be a way of gaining insight into system operation, and experts who have experienced doing that intentionally to test their system also see unexpected breakage as a potential analytic, and they seize the opportunity to use it. So for example, one developer was commissioned to do performance and scalability testing of a 20,000 no distributed client server application in Europe. There were three main environments along the lines of the developer test environment, pre-production and post-production environments. Errors in the developer test environment and pre-production environment meant that the consultant developer was effectively blocked from doing the performance testing. Um, it was supposed to be fit to use either of those environments for performance testing. However, in practice, there was no availability for his testing, no software tools to perform the performance testing, and so on. As it was a client server system entirely designed, written, and implemented by the overall team who worked for the service provider, someone would have to write or find a tool to perform protocol level performance testing. This led to an opportunity to learn about an unsung part of the system the file transfer service. So while trying to analyze the behavior of the file transfer software, the consultant developer entered commands manually via a software interface. And he inadvertently miskeyed the protocol messages. This led to an unexpected behavior. The system exposed sensitive information. Oops. So there might be major flaws in the implementation. This despite the fact that the chief architect was convinced that the system did work and it would work at scale. The responses from the protocol, which was a server service, provided an opportunity to go and read the source code of the file server and to talk with the developers of that code. Um, the code was written in C, which has known weaknesses in terms of safety and robustness. <laughs> 
Um, and as he didn't have access to pre-production, uh, special clearance was obtained to give him access, and one of the Perl scripting gurus offered to code scripts to accelerate the testing manifold, and indeed they paired up for some testing. They then had an interactive mechanism to quickly probe the server. They could tweak and refine the scripts, run them, see what the results were, discuss the results, and so on. Their scripts demonstrated that they could create and replace arbitrary files at the destination. The destination could be almost any and all of the nodes in the system. So there were some significant issues with the software. Uh, a number of types or categories of test cases were designed and implemented, and as you can see, they address familiar flaws, but they hadn't been exposed by prior testing. When the new flaws were discovered, they created suitable tests to ensure that fixes could be, uh, could be tested as well. Similarly, their, their scripts were run in the production environment, showing that production was vulnerable and demonstrating that buffer overflow occurred and that the script created a marker file on the target computer. So lots of things were going on, that they used different tools to find. They worked as a pair, uh, doing pair debugging um, and collaboration helped them work quickly and effectively despite various organizational boundaries. So experts reflect on their tools as well as their code. How can you verify that an analysis tool is doing what it's meant to? Um, experts play methods against each other to increase the likelihood of detection. For example, building errors into code to test the test harness. Experts address tool limitations by combining or swapping among multiple tools. To quote one developer, often it's the mishmash of different ways of thinking that gets you the answer. Here's an example um, provided by an informant. I'll give you a moment to scan it. So to repeat a quotation from a previous story, this shows the value of hitting the problem with more than one hammer. Multiple techniques or tools imply more ways to think. However, they also entail greater, co greater cognitive overheads and they require intelligent coordination. So the selection of tools isn't arbitrary. Teams try tools, they assess their merits. They assemble toolkits that fit both their development culture and span different perspectives. Experts reassess the landscape and deliberately expand the search space. As Bill Curtis famously said, writing the code isn't the problem. Understanding the problem is the problem. In a study by Curtis Krasner and Isco, the domain knowledge was identified as one of, if not the primary factor related to the success of a software system. If your code isn't working, maybe you don't understand the problem. The business of standing back and reflecting on the landscape is crucial. We all know of examples where the software met the specification, but the specification was inadequate. Um, Peter Ladkin commented on the 2015 Airbus A400M crash in Spain, that it might have been the first aviation accident whose cause was directly attributable to software error. That is, until then, all software errors were actually requirements errors. That is, the software did what it was required to do, but what it was required to do was incorrect or incomplete. Uh, for example, it didn't consider the effect of a second failure. Similarly, Daryl Ince documented the failure of a record-keeping system for social workers in the United Kingdom. What was provided was a form-based system that required and constrained entries to a number of specified fields. The result of rolling out this system was that instead of spending 80% of their time with clients, social workers spent the majority of their time wrestling with the system. The software met its specification, but it wasn't fit for purpose because it was specified by the wrong stakeholders. They didn't consult the social workers. Uh, in another example, um, one developer explained it this way. Um, in his words, what I've found useful is use case driven development. What demo am I making? What should we make that will be great? What's the gap between what we have and what we want? It's like a forcing function. It's pressed us to make our system to scale, 
to be more efficient, to be more beautiful in terms of the interface. And it's win-win because you develop a framework and you can turn it around and showcase it because you're going to have a demo for that. You're always looking for what it could do, not just for what it can do. It's a way of stressing a system and growing a system. Reassessing the landscape is a way of examining behaviors, understanding constraints, revealing assumptions, and looking beyond the immediate issues, reasoning about the essence of the problem and what might constitute a solution. Hence, potentially admitting more possible solutions or broadening the definition of the problem in a way that provides insights and overcomes flaws. And experts do this periodically throughout the design and development process, not just at the beginning, all the way through well into maintenance. And this is at odds with many software development methodologies, uh, which one of my colleagues is, thinks is akin to you know, getting on in a big semi on the motorway and just trundling down until you reach your destination. Um, a lot of development methodologies are concerned with converging to a solution. So sometimes it's a really good idea to get out of the truck and step away from the methodology for a different perspective. As part of reassessing the landscapes, developers keep an eye on their goals, and they distinguish between their goals and the tools they use to meet them. This is in contrast to what's been called variously metric servitude or error by proxy. Um, as Mike Hoy expressed it, people so easily fall into the trap of aiming for the metric instead of aiming for the result. Or as Richard Hamming expressed it, you get what you measure. Again, quoting Hamming, accuracy of measurement tends to get confused with relevance of measurement, much more than most people believe. That a measurement is accurate, reproducible, and easy to make does not mean that it should be done. Instead, a much poorer one, which is more closely related to your goals, may be much more preferable. High-performing teams match their tools to their purpose and their goals. They swap between tools, or they put them down as needed, and this includes tools such as methodology and notations. Mauricio Amiche gave an example in his It Will Never Work in Theory talk on code coverage tools in testing. His advice was, first write tests based on the specification, then use a coverage tool to look for gaps. That is, use code coverage to augment your test suite as a tool, not as a target. One developer put this into perspective. In his words, we use code coverage as a way of measuring what functions have not been tested yet. But I, it can assess the quality of the test case itself. I can write a test case for a function and get code coverage, but the test case could be lousy and not test anything. So we use code review, that is, dialogues about code, to assess the quality of the test case itself. Code review is about testing the intentions of the function. What should this thing be doing? Pair debugging, as I've mentioned a few times already, is something that most of the high-performing teams do, and people really don't talk about much. Um, developers sit together and talk through code, often deliberately with people of notionally different level of, of expertise or who know different parts of the code base. This brings fresh perspective to the code, it spreads knowledge of the code among the team, and it has a tendency to expose assumptions, misconceptions, and miscommunications. For example, one, organize, one organization I observed understood these benefits and used them, uh, used pair debugging and collaborative code review as onboarding mechanisms. Um, so they'd identify a variety of pull requests that covered issues distributed around the code base and assign them to the new recruit. In the course of addressing these requests, the recruit engaged in pair debugging with different members of the team, thereby becoming familiar with both the structure of the code base and the expertise in the team and meeting everybody and having a chance to talk to them, all in the course of doing real work. Experts don't expect to know everything. Indeed, most experts deny their expertise um, because they're aware of the limitations of their knowledge. Um, when I go into industry and want to find out who the experts are, I ask everybody and I look for the one person that everybody is pointing to except the one person who's pointing to someone else. That's the one. Pair debugging is one way that developers reach out. More broadly, developers use, involve others both inside their team and outside their team 
when they have a purpose for doing so, often to um, obtain specialized technical or domain knowledge, but sometimes just to externalize their thinking. So there are different facets to this. One is externalizing. Um, you might be familiar with rubber ducking or the inflatable programmer, um, where a developer talks through a problem either with a colleague or with an inanimate proxy for a colleague. Um, the point is that externalizing the issue, explaining it to someone else, can make the reasoning more explicit and concrete, often breaking the unproductive cycle and providing insight. Um, another facet is the don't guess ask impulse. For example, one developer was working on the main control loop for a diesel engine controller. It was a standard proportional integral differential control structure with feed forward adjustments. In his words, the mathematics was correct, but proving it was correct was way beyond me. So I found an expert in the engineering department of Cambridge University who was happy to work through the mathematics, money well spent. As another developer put it, the realization is you don't know everything, but there's probably somebody who might. And experts don't wait to ask. They know that asking sooner is better. So, we've covered a number of practices and perspectives that enable developers to embrace error and realize it as opportunity to understand, question, and diagnose. There is a repeated theme of attending to the big picture through reflection, through minding the gaps, through attending to contrary evidence, uh, and, assess and reassessing the search space. Within that, there are different mechanisms that provide informative contrast and comparison. To sum up, experts use systematic, disciplined practices that are socially embedded and reinforced. Importantly, because there is a disciplined culture, they're able to rely on the team to catch slips, thereby giving individuals the freedom to experiment. Study of high-performing teams makes it clear that the interplay between designers plays a crucial part in nurturing creativity and innovation, on the one hand, as well as embedding systematic practice and rigor, on the other hand, and hence handling error effectively. The team culture, which leverages individual strengths and multiple perspectives, provides the safety net, and the dialogues are essential to that. There is a caveat to this approach to error. The focus is on fixing the error, not fixing the blame. The team culture matters. It embodies the mindset that sees error as opportunity, that sees, that embraces multiple perspectives, uh, that reinforces practices such as triage, playing methods against each other, pair debugging, that routinely challenge understanding and assumptions. And that's seen as positive. This helps strengthen and develop the team as well improving the culture. Without that culture, teams can stagnate. Without that culture, groups of high-performing individuals may never cohere into a high-performing team. But differently, software expertise doesn't happen by accident. Uh, there are practices that you can understand and invest in. By making space in your organizational culture and by investing time for this mindset, these sorts of practices, these dialogues, you're making space for expertise to work and grow, and for expert level software development to become possible. Thank you for listening. I hope that you, this has given you a chance to, uh, an opportunity to reflect on your practice and that there have been some resonances for you. And again, if you have comments or examples, I would love to hear from you. Okay, one good question to get started, I guess. Um, many of us are now getting into a mode where we're working remotely, working from home, and a lot of what you talked about was very much about culture and uh, like social, uh, I guess, phenomenon that you know, people can use to, uh, to work through these areas. How does working from home and working remotely ha affect the things that you've been discussing? Um, I think anybody who's been working just from home knows the costs by now. Um, and the costs come in terms, typically, of some of the informal interactions that people have rather than the formal ones. So the, the teams that work remotely and do it effectively have a couple of ingredients. One is they know each other one way or another, either because they spend t enough time one-on-one -on -one dialogue online or because they've met face-to-face. 
Um, and they also work on the channels that they have for impromptu conversations. So um, I know a lot of people use Slack. That works for some people. But others, just make sure that you can, you can drop a message and make a call. Can I have a minute? So that can I have a minute is normal. It isn't the kind of intrusion that it can seem to be online. Um, one of the things I know for high-performing teams that have, uh, an have an international collection, they have distributed teams, they really work at the beginning to form a, a shared culture so that they overcome different interpretations and, and different um, local norms so that there is this sense of which things are OK and their demonstrations of it. And so they do things like they'll ship people around to other sites uh, to make them familiar um, so that when they interact on, online, it's a different thing. Um, so it is about understanding the importance of basically the conversations around the coffee machine and to find an alternative to that um, online. And there are ways to do that. I hope that answers your question, Ish. Hi. My name's Michael. Thank you very much for your talk this morning. Very, very nice. Um, I, you hinted at it a couple of times, but I'm wondering if you can go a little deeper in how the experts on these high-functional teams engage the novice to bring them along faster. Is there additional training, something that they did to help the whole team accelerate? The biggest thing that they do is, OK, there are two parts. One is the team culture inherently helps with that, but they're very conscious about pairing people up. So the pair debugging may well be with the expert and the novice, not because it's because the expert probably has a really good way of articulating things, probably has the best knowledge of the code base, probably knows how to make the bridging that says, oh, you need to talk to Fred over there about that one. Um, but in addition to doing that, to help and provide a kind of safe space for asking questions. Um, they then also make sure that the novice is paired up with other people. The estimates for how long it takes for a novice to integrate properly into a team and into a code base vary, but they vary from one year to three years. I mean, we're not talking about short term. And so there isn't an, ex an expectation that someone will instantaneously not need any of this, because everybody needs it. So part of what works is the notion that it's OK to ask. No matter what, it's OK to ask. Um, so one of the things that distinguishes high-performing teams is really interesting is what they retain in terms of, of indications of performance are not how many mistakes you made, but how many good ideas you had. Right? So if you ask good questions, it doesn't matter if you sometimes ask bad questions or you know, what appear to be silly questions. Very often, silly questions are actually quite insightful. Um, and so what, you're, what happens is because they value the reaching out, the reaching out happens more. And with more reaching out, you get better integration of people into the team and better education over time. They also work at what they call rattling the basket. So that rather than leaving people stuck in roles, they try to use people for what they're best at, but they also try to give them, to move them around, to spark them often. Thank you. Oh gosh, a cue. <laughs> Hi, thank you. This was really cool. And I have a biology background, and this also made me feel like I should get paid a lot of money. So thank you. Um, so. I really enjoyed this, I enjoyed the approach, and most of the engineers I've worked with also, I think, really want to take the more systems focused and the more like ecological focus, like you said, and we often have a hard time conveying the value of that to the people who are setting priorities for what we're building. And I think we're often asked to justify taking time to focus on these things on like a quarter by quarter, here's the value. Mm -hmm. um, and can, so can you talk about some ways that you would convey to your like product organization, here's what you're going to see in one quarter, here's what you're going to see in two quarters, 
It doesn't look like features, but it has value. I'm not sure I can answer you directly, but I'll give you an observation, which is that in the high-performing teams, there is typically the, the, the guru in the corner, the expert, is very often the bridge between his team and the management. Okay, and it's typically somebody who can speak management speak as well as do the engineering. And very often, so there is someone who is, and in sometimes, in some places I've seen this split into two roles where there's the technical lead who has a very intimate relationship with the project manager, the project lead who, who takes that interface role. Those are the people, if they, if there is someone who has authority and who has a track record for productivity, that's where that argument gets made, because they'll be saying things like, wait and see. So there, it, and it shows up other places, because the people who understand the organizational dynamics can work with them. So their estimation is different. If the organization demands something, you know, something from them that's unreasonable, they will kick back. They won't just accept it. Um, and they're able to articulate the trade-offs very explicitly to them. You know, we can deliver it on time and it, it won't do these things, or you can give us the extra N months and it will do this. Make a choice. Um, pay the consequences. So there's a, it's, it's, I don't have a simple answer to that one, um, but in effect, they, because they know the difference between the metrics and the purpose, they very often draw the dialogues with management back to purpose, albeit framed in ways that, I'm using management in this pejorative way, I do apologize to people. I hope you understand what I mean. Um, to to the, the, the people outside the team. Um, so they, they manage to tie the decisions to purpose while also translating it into the, la the language of the out people outside the team. Hi. Uh, I don't think anyone yeah, else is over there. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I'm curious, so um, a lot of the insights you gave about experts were insights about experts in the development process, um, meaning an expert I've already hired. <laughs> I'm curious if, if you have any insights into identifying expertise during the interview process so that I can hire those people to then <laughs> Do things and build this expert team with? So that's a question that comes up. I mean, that's a question that um, I discuss with Mike Hoy at various points. Um, so the thing that Andre Vanderhoek, my collaborator, and I believe on the basis of all the f empirically grounded insights that are in the little yellow book um, is that what you're looking for is a mindset. So the kinds of things that, that indicate someone is headed toward expertise has, have to do with their approach to error, have to do with their engagement with diverse problems, have to do with the way they handle dialogues, um, have to do with whether they look at alternatives and maintain alternatives, whether they understand provisionality. So, and it isn't a checklist per se, but what we had talked about previously was the notion that you could, for example, look through the insights in the book and say, do we see some of these manifest in the conversation? Not specific ones, but any of them. Is, is there evidence of the mindset? When somebody comes to talk to you, do they only talk about the solution or do they talk about the problem and do they talk about the context in which the problem resides? So we went to do um, some design videos with people where they, they, we had two people at a whiteboard and they responded to a design prompt. And we asked the companies that we went to to give us some of their good designers. And we, the, Andre showed up at one of these, and the designer was surprisingly young. So they did the video, and it was a terrific design dialogue. And afterward, they said to him, how did you get to be what you are? And his response was, while I was studying, I picked every problem I didn't know how to solve. I looked for all the things that, that I wasn't sure about. I wasn't afraid to try things out and start by failing and then find somebody to help me out. And he had 
over the course of his notionally relatively short career, addressed lots of different things and then had conversations with lots of interesting people. And that propensity to that openness of attitude, the mindset that said, I need to understand how to understand problems before I dive into solutions, um, marked him out and was evident in the kinds of conversations that he had with people um, and that lack of fear. So I think looking for the mindset is the short answer. Awesome, thanks so much. Hi, uh, thanks again for the talk. Hopefully this is a fun one. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the design inspiration for the balloon animal illustrations? <laughs> Um, the design inspiration. So, so all of the illustrations in the Little Yellow Book and most of the, the drawn things that were in the talk are by a very talented young illustrator named In Quach. And she has a real knack for listening to a conversation and making sense of it and providing illustrations of it. Um, but lots of ideas are much easier to get over if you have a bit of a giggle with them. Um, and so we were looking just for interesting ways of conveying the insights without locking them to a specific example um, in the domain when everybody would say, well, it, it, that insight is only connected to that example and I won't generalize from it. So, a bit of play. Playful is good. Awesome, thanks. Okay. Hi, thank you. So, you mentioned that um, all software errors are specification errors and I think a room full of developers, we We'd all agree. Um, but I was interested in your story about the social worker application where the, the people who specify the design of the software were not the people actually using it. And so I'm interested in uh, any observations you may have about, in particular in, in a consulting world or contract world where you have a specific client. Um, how would a software team that's being effective, how would they perhaps encourage the client to include the right opinions, um, say, when specifying the software? It's an interesting one. I, so I'm not a software developer, but I did do consultancy and interaction design. And there was a company who used to, of software developers. They would hire me in to do user studies because their management didn't think it was appropriate. So the, the software engineers knew it was, and they wanted to do, have more access to their, to their customers. So knowing that there are some people who listen more to people you pay for than externally, so they brought me in to provide evidence of something they already knew. And I went out and I would go study the, the users and present what the user said and the sales and marketing people go, oh my goodness, that is astonishing, where did you get that from? Um, it's, the companies that I know, there is such a conviction in these teams that they really need to engage with users that it, it becomes, it's bottom line for them. That's, and if, if, if the client doesn't understand that they need it, they'll go do it anyway. Um, and I think that's what happens. And then there's a demonstration by outcome. Because they've engaged with users, because they've found something that ever, other people overlooked, um, they then get credibility. And once they have that credibility, then they can dictate terms much more easily in the future. So a lot of the changes that people make in terms of development culture come from demonstrations of e efficacy. You know, they have evidence that it works. Um, and sometimes it's because I did this previously and I can show you the outcome. You know, if you want to know how these guys got their IP, let me tell you. And sometimes it's by stealth, but it's, it's the, the best way to convince somebody is to show them the outcomes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, I think we need to uh, end at this time um, so okay. we can pull, put the walls up for the next session, but thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Woo!